there was a gentleman who was in there and I didn't want to move. I didn't want to walk. It hurt. And he was, he was great. He pushed me. He told me to get out of bed. Fighting COVID together, we look to bounce back after this week. Nevada became the state with the most hospitalizations per capita. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this special newscast tonight. I'm Joe Hart. And I'm Shelby Sheehan. I'm Denise Wong. And I'm Noah Bond. Tonight, Colo 8, News 4, PBS Reno, Cumulus Media, and Lotus Communications are teaming up to fight COVID together. We want to show all the ways COVID is impacting our community. The victims of COVID are far and wide. Hundreds locally have already lost their lives to COVID-19. Family members, friends, and neighbors have passed away. It affects everyone, not just those who get the virus, from health care and education to businesses and unemployment. We've all had to adjust to a new normal over the last year. But tonight is not about doom and gloom. We know that if we work together, we can find ways to support our families and our neighbors. And the time to take action is right now. And we'll be sharing stories from people in different walks of life so we can stay united through whatever comes next. Well, throughout the pandemic, we have talked about our frontline health care workers, and we are so grateful for their courageous service during COVID. I sat down with a renowned physician and two critical care nurses who shared with me what these last nine months have been like and how they keep keeping on. Who could have imagined when the coronavirus pandemic started nine months ago that today we would be here? We've been around COVID. We're kind of used to it. Um, the difference now is so many more people have it. More people are dying. Um, and uh, for the staff, the tough part is the numbers that we're having. Expanding intensive care units, filling overflow facilities, all to take care of the second, larger, stronger wave of sick patients. Renowned hospital specialist Dr. Tom Herbert says they know much more about COVID now and how to treat it than they did in March but they are in the midst of a battle like never before. What I see is people are showing up every day. They're putting on um, a strong face and they're seeing patients and the morale is good. And the morale is much better, way better than I would have expected. Registered nurse Emily Sharp has been working in the ICU for three years now and says critically ill people and death are a part of working there. But COVID has made her job much harder. For us, it was having to help people pass with their families on Zoom, holding their hands. So that's the hardest part. The healthcare teams who are the link between patients and loved ones are feeling that burden. Sharp says they survive by knowing there will be wins too. I think this has been going on for so long that we are all emotionally, physically drained from it. Um, it's just, I really do think it's all about the people you're with and really trying to celebrate those wins when you do get them. That spirit of support and connection is also what Madison Foley, a cardiac ICU nurse, counts on to get through this time. When you're having a hard day, your neighbor is here to kind of help you. And even emotionally, you know, we can... I see a nurse today walking down the hall and you know, you could just tell that they're just tired and you're like, hey, like, what can I help you with? Keep in mind, once these healthcare heroes leave their lives at the hospital, they go home to their personal COVID lives, not seeing their families and friends like before. The very people who normally would be the perfect antidote for a tough day on the job. It's not what we signed up for, but it is in a sense because these people are still people that need help. Um, either way you look at it, and if you're not going to do it, then who is? These dedicated workers say they see the light at the end of the tunnel with a vaccine. But until we get there, they hope the community can hang on and support them. I would just tell the community, you know, keep washing your hands and, you know, social distancing, wearing your masks just for a little bit longer. And that's that would be the biggest help to us. I'm Shelby Sheehan fighting COVID together. Thanks, Shelby, for that. Well, thousands of northern Nevadans have survived COVID-19. While some only experienced mild symptoms, others had near-death experiences and will be recovering for weeks or even months to come. Ben Marjan has tonight's survivor story. November 23rd was a morning Angie Tesla may never remember. And then I don't remember a thing after that. 
but it's a morning her husband Jay will never forget. I was really scary that I, you know, might not get her back the way I remember her. He found his wife, who is 37 with no underlying conditions, unresponsive. Her oxygen levels so low, doctors at Mammoth Hospital confirmed she had coronavirus, then airlifted her to Renown. By that night, doctors brought her oxygen levels back up, and she was no longer critical. So they moved her to the parking garage, recently converted to care for COVID patients, the same garage President Trump implied was fake in a tweet. But it hurts when people tell me that that was fake. It's not fake. I was just a normal person. Angie was there with about 30 other COVID patients who battled the virus together. There was a gentleman who was in there, and I didn't want to move. I didn't want to walk. It hurt. And he was, he was great. He pushed me. He told me to get out of bed. On the day of our interview, five days after being released, Angie was still recovering, still monitoring her oxygen levels all day long, still struggling to talk and move. Angie has a long road ahead, but recovering from a virus that has killed so many and almost took her own life has given her perspective. I'm grateful for every breath now, um, every moment. I'm Ben Marjot, fighting COVID together. And for the first time, we have a look inside the COVID intensive care unit at St. Mary's Hospital in Reno. Kim Burroughs shows us how staff are treating the sickest COVID patients and the message they have for all of us. It's, it's a, uh... Devastating. COVID patients fighting for their lives. Almost every person on ventilators that force air into their lungs. Ventilator, artificial breathing, induced coma. All of these patients are very, very sick, uh, requiring a lot of resources. This is the ICU where staff took care of critically ill patients, but now it is just the COVID unit. There are 15 people here fighting for their lives. A total of three departments house about 65 COVID patients at St. Mary's Hospital. We are planning as capacity grows, as more patients come in, alternative care sites uh, such as this one, creating more critical care beds uh, for these patients needing ventilators and just basic medical needs. You have the beds, what about the staff? The staff is where our community at large is, is struggling. Staff work long hours and they're emotionally drained. It can be overwhelming for seeing a um, influx of patients. This is the emergency room. Staff are busy treating COVID patients here too. It's what we signed up for, taking care of these people, you know, and uh, it feels good to go home and know that you're making a difference. Back in the COVID ICU. It's not a quick virus that they recoup. It's a four week battle that goes on every day. Some of these patients will not survive. We have a patient that's not doing too well, so we have most of our staff in there trying to help for nurses, respiratory therapists, a physician, trying to save this patient. Family members are not allowed in. Their risk is too great. Staff try to FaceTime their loved ones for some kind of a connection. So these patients, when they are dying, they are alone. There's a message staff wants you to hear as COVID cases surge. Our community is Northern Nevada. We are here to, as a hospital society, to help you guys. I think it's your turn now to help us. We need help by following the mask mandate, by following the distancing. I'm Kim Burroughs, fighting COVID together. Well, for people with COVID, getting into a hospital bed can mean the difference between life or death. News 4's Taylor Winkle has a look now at how Renown adapted to make sure they would have the space to give the care that is needed. The last 10 days have been the hardest in his life. Yeah, I really miss my family. Javier Alcala's COVID-19 diagnosis landed him in Renown's respiratory ICU. <coughs> what was it like when you were upstairs? It's hell. For five days, fighting to breathe and then listening to his dying roommate's loved ones say their final goodbyes over speakerphone. Make feel like, oh my God, I got to make it. When nurses finally downgraded Javier's condition, he transferred here to the alternate care site set up in Renown's parking garage, the last stop before home. So when I walk inside, all the fresh air and the beds, oh, I can sleep, I can clear my mind because that was the biggest problem <coughs> upstairs. Javier's story of, 
you know, him being scared and him seeing a roommate pass away. Um, you know, that's why we wanted to build this environment. Janet Baum is the head nurse. Never in a million years would I thought that we would ever be providing care in this environment. As Renown's respiratory ICU and specialty care units filled, they opened up this converted parking garage. It holds 1,400 patients. Right now, staff are setting up more privacy barriers, preparing for another influx. To be able to quickly make space for them, have providers at the bedside for them, I mean, they're counting on that. And today, as one patient leaves, you're going to get to see your family again oh, very soon. I know. In a few hours. How does that feel? I feel really good. Yeah. Yeah, I can wait. Unfortunately, another will take his spot. I'm Taylor Winkle, fighting COVID together. Tough situation. We do want you to see the reality, though, on the front lines of the situation. And for patients fighting to stay alive, one piece of medical equipment can really be their lifeline, literally helping them to keep breathing. Zach Slotmaker reports from inside Renown's ICU. In a visit to Renown's respiratory ICU, you see a mix of everything we've heard about since March. Filled beds. Busy staff and a machine tasked with carrying out a critical function for life, breathing. Uh, a ventilator at the basic level is a form of life support. Um, it's utilized in the sickest of the sick people. While it doesn't cure COVID, Simpson says without a ventilator's help, a critically ill patient cannot breathe normally. And there's a reason it's used as the last resort. It's a very dangerous tool. I mean, if you're delivering a breath, um, there's multiple phases of a breath. Um, if you're delivering it incorrectly, it can be very harmful to a patient. Instead, the focus is on other, less invasive options such as proning, where a patient is flipped on their belly for long periods of time to improve oxygenation. Or they lean on another piece of technology called a nasal high flow. And what it is, is a tube that can handle a higher amount of oxygen flow. These devices deliver 40, 50, 60 liters per minute or more of oxygen. Sarzinski says the nasal flow significantly reduces the number of ventilators in use on any given day. We've already seen that we're able to prevent people from going on ventilators and we've I think the physician group has dropped their threshold as to when they put these patients on to mechanical ventilation. Zach Slotmaker fighting COVID together. And the pandemic is changing everything we do, and that includes how we teach our children. As distance learning continues, so do the challenges of teaching virtually. Joe has more in this report. Washoe County students have been learning from home off and on since last April, when distance learning first launched because of the pandemic. The district superintendent says this transition to a new way of teaching and learning is not easy for anyone. It's been a challenge. It's been a challenge for our students. It's been a challenge for our families, and it's been a challenge for our educators. McNeil says the district is doing what it can to meet those challenges. They've hired a distance learning director, and they're focused on maintaining structure for students and staff. That's not always easy, given that middle and high school students have much more freedom right now compared to a traditional classroom setting. Setting expectations up for our students you need to show up on time. You need to complete your work. You need to show how, you know, how engaged you are. McNeil says one of the keys to success for students is having a quiet, organized place at home to study. Whether distance learning becomes the norm after the new year will depend a lot on how well a vaccine can stem the tide of this pandemic. Until then, one of the biggest lessons for students will continue to be adapting to this new way of living and learning. I'm Joe Hart for fighting COVID together. Recently, the Washoe County School Board of Trustees voted to extend distance learning for middle and high school students until January 19th. Elementary students will continue their work in the classroom. While educators are not alone adapting to these new circumstances, students and families have adjusted in ways many never imagined that they'd have to. And that's why we all need to work together to fight COVID, to help our children to get the education they need. And it's why Northern Nevada broadcasters are bringing you this joint message on local television and radio stations. 
And with the move to online learning, many students in Washoe County feel unmotivated, putting their futures in jeopardy. Colo 8 News Now's Kurt Schroeder learned about one family's experience learning from home and what it will take to get students back into the classroom. <laughs> Tanisha Adams and her mom Mandy Brown love spending time together. They've been doing a lot of that recently because they have to. The coronavirus has forced Tanisha to do her schoolwork online from home. I feel like this pandemic definitely set me back a lot. The senior at Reno's Redfield Academy really misses being in the classroom and getting one-on-one -on -one help from her teachers, whether it's school related or not. Here, it's a little bit different because I have to I have to text my teachers. I have to call them and sometimes, you know, teachers aren't available. They they have a life also. Tanisha isn't the only student in Washoe County struggling with the motivational aspect of learning from home. She has a job she goes to as well. Not being able to physically separate her school life from her personal life has been challenging. I have to sit here and I have to really like push myself, really tell myself every day to get on that computer and to do some work because I know that I need a diploma at the end of the day. Tanisha's mom, Mandy, understands why the Washoe County School District chose to move older students to the online learning model. It's safer that way. Her mother also stays with the family and is battling lupus. Not bringing the virus into the house is critical. Getting teenagers to follow safety protocols to not spread the virus is nearly impossible. They're not going to want to keep the mask on all the time, you know, and stay, you know, 10 six, ten, ten feet away or whatever. <laughs> so I would rather have my children be at home. But not all families prefer to have their kids learning from home. They want their kids back in school, learning in a classroom. For that to happen, it takes all of us to stay safe and defeat the virus. I'm Kurt Schroeder with Fighting COVID Together. The COVID effect on families is not just in education. If we go into lockdown, jobs and paychecks are at stake. It's a reason we all need to work together to fight COVID. Terry Russell has one worker story who, because of her trade, stands to lose the most but can least afford to. You've heard the expression chief cook and bottle washer? That's Jessie Goddard. Oh, she's not a cook here at Old Granite Street Eatery but she is about everything else. As a matter of fact, she is a bottle washer, as well as a bartender, cashier, waitress, and bus person. She orders supplies, hires personnel, and manages all on shift. It's tough to keep up with her here at the restaurant. Yeah, yeah, I've pretty much been doing this since I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I really love this industry. But the business has changed dramatically for her since COVID, especially last March when the state shut down all but essential services. Trying to at least make my bills, you know, my car payment, my rent, things like that. She went on unemployment for a time during the two month hiatus. She says the money helped with rent and other expenses, but she said she had some down days. A landlord breathing down her neck, questions about her future, and imagining the worst. I have my days of stress, absolutely. Um, worried about bills, and this time around, you know, if, if I were to have to go on unemployment, it's not going to be the same as it was. So that's really stressful. The restaurant eventually reopened, but it meant major adjustments. She would work fewer hours and she would take on additional responsibility, which included having to let go of her co-workers. So it was difficult to kind of tell your friends and people you've worked with for over a year that there's just no work for them. What was your name? David. David. All right, right over here. We can only have 16 people in the restaurant. So it's like there's really only room for one person on the floor at all times. Fewer customers mean fewer tips. Not as many orders, less cash for the restaurant. It is truly an illustration of getting by with less. She says she closely watches her finances these days, no longer getting her hair and nails done on a regular basis. There are simple things she says she misses, like visiting her family and gathering with their friends. But through it all, she remains optimistic. She wants people to go out, to follow the rules like wearing masks and making reservations. And then she says she can perhaps have more days like today. Today was a really good day. You can never really expect anything, but today was a great day. But there's no way to predict when Jesse will have a good day or bad day. And the same can be said of the owners of this restaurant. They have the awesome responsibility of cutting Jesse a paycheck as well as keeping the lights on and paying the landlord. Yeah, there's no roadmap for this. Uh, there's no business owner that will come to you and say, here's exactly what you do. 
Old Granite Street Eatery owners Kevin and Kaya Stanley say these times call for innovation and perseverance. A look out the restaurant window, a view of the courthouse and other businesses where lunch was just a short walk away. For two years, business was good. Yeah, lunch is very busy, uh, going into happy hours, uh, going into uh, dinners, and then these same, these same office workers that would bring their, bring their families back to this familiar place on the weekend. Anytime there was an event, there was a couple hour waiting list. In March this year, they were forced to close. They admit there was a moment of hesitation. There was a minute though where we had the option to panic and just be paralyzed because when you can't, restaurants don't work on huge margins. So when the restaurant can't be open, how are you gonna make money to pay staff and rent and buy food? But the moment of paralysis was only temporary. The couple looked at ways to meet the community's needs with what they had on hand. For a time, the restaurant turned into a small market for those in the area who could not venture out or risk potential viral exposure. The couple then discovered they could join forces with Rounds for Heroes and feed hospital workers who could not leave their ships as they took care of patients hardest hit by the virus. They continue that work with more than two dozen other local restaurants who prepare those meals with the help of private donors and benefactors. While all of that allows them to look beyond themselves, they often take personal stock, especially these days where the governor has implemented what he calls a pause. A restaurant cannot sustain at 25% and keep paying bills and it's so it just it's not workable. So um, our landlord has been great to work with. They've applied for government loans and received a Paycheck Protection Program grant, but the small business loan is in limbo. Stanley's made an investment to cover tables and countertops in steel for easy disinfection of surfaces. There have been other changes as well. The couple believes the current business environment does not call for an all or nothing proposition. They imagine a middle ground where customers can go out and enjoy a meal, but it will mean some compromise. We're intimately aware of how real this, this surge is besides just what you hear on the news. We see it, we see it every day. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, I don't care. For me to operate, you have to wear a mask. You sit down, you eat, you can take it off. You're drinking, take it off. You walk into the bathroom, put it back on. Um, these are the guidelines I have to follow and I don't think it's anybody's place to put my business at risk. Like, it's just not a big deal. Like, just do it and let us stay in business. The couple says they are not ready to use the word defeated. Instead, they say they will continue to pivot and contribute to a community which understands only united can we withstand these uncertain times. I'm Terry Russell with Fighting COVID Together. And if you lose your job because of the pandemic, there may not be federal assistance to help you make ends meet. Pandemic unemployment assistance, also known as PUA, expires on December 26th. Another federal program, the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Fund, or PEUC, is only available until December 31st. Congress has not yet passed any extensions, but there is work underway in Washington. This is how we get things done. We come together in a bipartisan way, we work, we compromise, and we figure out what, what the needs are uh, for our communities and really uh, across this country what Americans need right now. Even iconic long-standing businesses are not immune to the virus. The owner of the historic Santa Fe Hotel told me his restaurant couldn't survive the pandemic. A Reno original. 71 years after the Santa Fe Hotel first opened its doors in downtown, the restaurant now sits empty. You know, we had built that business and it was getting going and doing well. This tiny room. Dennis Banks bought it back in 2017 with big plans to restore it, while also keeping with the traditional Basque menu and family style communal dining that made this place a local favorite. He reopened in July 2019, but it was no match for the coronavirus in 2020. It shut down during the statewide closure in March. When it finally welcomed back diners a couple months later, it was only open for about a week before the downtown riots. The very next night, the city imposed a 5.30 p.m. curfew, which didn't work for this dinner establishment. It closed for roughly three weeks more. 
And then? When we reopened, we were reopened for just a few days and we got the no bar top implemented. And the Santa Fe really requires a bar to have a, you know any business or atmosphere that's successful. So at that point I said, fifth, sixth, seventh, whatever time is a charm and that's enough for me. Dennis says financially closing the restaurant back in July made sense, but emotionally it's been tough. One of his other businesses, the Hard Water House, has already closed for good, and the two Napa Sonomas he still owns are now struggling with the latest restrictions, limiting capacity to just 25 percent. It just is wearing me out. It's just so much every day. There's something new, you know. You got to have all these people and they need their jobs. But he's trying to stay hopeful and trying to find a path forward for the Santa Fe because he knows this is a very special place for both the Basque and Reno communities. Harris was possibly looking to buy it, made me an offer. They wanted to tear it down and that wasn't a choice that I was willing to make. So yeah, the building's special and we just have to kind of ride it out. All right, so what can you do in these uncertain times? Shop local. Fighting together against the pandemic means supporting our local businesses as best we can, even in this time of social distancing. Developer Partols tells us that uh, he thinks that the small business will survive if we can keep him going through his short-term troubles. I think experiential retail will always be there. You're always going to want to go out to eat. You're always going to want to window shop and go to boutique stores just because it's recreational and it's a part of how we spend time together. Now by working together to support our local businesses, we can all help to save the restaurants, stores, gyms, and other businesses that we rely on here in Northern Nevada. And that will also help to protect the jobs that our families, friends, and neighbors rely on. Tonight, we showed you a look behind the scenes in our local healthcare facilities, how both teachers and students are juggling a new learning environment and ways local businesses are constantly addressing to health regulations to keep you safe while you shop. We know there are different opinions about COVID, but we can all make wise choices to get through this crisis together. We end tonight with a message of hope that if we are willing to work together, we will find ways to support our families and our neighbors. And as we've seen tonight in these stories, the time to act is now. Opening has afforded us the opportunity to help so many people. By summer, I really feel like things are gonna be in really good shape. We just have to kind of write it out. You can find this entire Fighting COVID Together special online at colotv.com and mynews4.com. We also appreciate our partners at PBS Reno, Cumulus Media, and Lotus Communications. With Colo 8 News Now, I'm Noah Bond. And I'm Denise Wong. And here at News 4, I'm Joe Hart. And I'm Shelby Sheehan. Thanks so much for joining us and have a good night and be well.